Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Buncombe Street. We're so excited that you have chosen to join us for worship today on this Easter Sunday. Uh, I hope you are excited for everything that God is gonna be doing here at our church. Hey, if you don't know me, my name's Chris Ashley. I'm one of the pastors here at our church, and I just wanted to come and welcome you. Just make sure you feel welcome, especially if this is your first time visiting with us. Uh, And I wanna let you know about one particular thing we've got that we're about to enter into. So after Easter, after this morning, we're gonna be entering into 21 days focused on missions here at our church. And so uh, there's gonna be a whole lot of things that are involved in that. You can go to our website or check out one of the brochures in the lobby and get all the info on all the different things we're gonna be doing. But the reason we wanna emphasize it this morning is starting tomorrow, we're actually going to be as a church uh, encouraging folks to pray for 21 days for our missions partners. And you can actually pick up one of the prayer guides in the lobby, they're, they're really well produced um, with all kinds of information on the different missions partners we have, things that you can be praying for for them. Um, so I would encourage you to do that before you leave this morning. Um, but hey, more than anything, happy Easter. We are so excited that you're here. I love to see all the pastels. As my uh, three-year-old told me, she said, Daddy, I like your bow. Um, so, you know, I got this nice tie. She thought it was a bow. It's okay. Hey, uh, we're gonna have a great, great morning of worship. You're gonna be super blessed today. Um, and I now, I now invite you to prepare your hearts for worship this morning.
you'll join with me now in the colic of the day. O oh God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to death on the cross, and by his glory shall make the Our Psalter is from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Who forgives all my iniquity, who heals all your diseases. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is the Lord's steadfast love toward the faithful. As far as the east is from the west, so far does the Lord renew our transgressions from us. For he has us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to the faithful. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. You may be seated. Let us pray. Risen Christ, that is who we worship, the risen Christ. You are our hope. And there are times that life can be rough. There can be challenging times. There are times when things are not as clear cut as we would like them to be. But because of Easter, we have hope for this life and the life to come. And help us to hold on to that hope and help us to share our hope to those who feel there is no hope. Jesus, you are more powerful than anything we may face in this life. You are more powerful than even death. You overcame death. You said to your disciples, don't be afraid. And you say to us, don't be afraid. I am alive and I am with you. And whatever you may be facing in this life, we thank you, Father, for that assurance. Now let us with boldness pray the Lord's Prayer saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our offertory hymn is hymn number 304. If you'll please stand.
let us pray. God of abundance, we offer these gifts to you in thanksgiving and joy for the presence of the living Christ. May these gifts bring new life to those near and far. And may we offer ourselves in service to you and to one another. Amen. You may be seated. Standing for our scripture reading. I'd like to read you the scripture this morning from Matthew chapter 28, verses 5 through 6. It says, The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Father, as always, especially on this Easter Sunday, I would ask that you bless the teaching and preaching of this word. May you be seen, heard, and experienced, and may I get out of the way. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. It's so awesome to see you on this Easter Sunday, obviously probably every pastor's favorite Sunday of the year. I'm excited about jumping into God's Word together. I'd done a lot of praying about what I wanted to speak on on this Easter Sunday. And there was something very specific the Lord placed on my heart. I want to speak to you today. I always preach about the resurrection, of course. But I want to speak to you today about the power that the resurrection has over sickness and death. Once again, the power that the resurrection has over sickness and death. If you're dealing with sickness, or if you're fearful of death, or if you're grieving the death of a loved one, or if you know someone who's going to die, that would be all of you. <laughs> Jesus came to defeat sickness and death. He conquered it. When they went to that empty tomb on that Easter morning, and he was not there, that same resurrection that Jesus experienced would be promised for all of his followers, meaning that sickness and death would not have the final victory, that death would only be the beginning, that death is a doorway into the eternal. And if we could grasp this, it would take away so much fear and angst and worry that we have about sickness and death and suffering. I see people all around me, and I will tell you that I struggle with this. I worry. Sometimes I have white coat syndrome. You ever do that? You walk in the doctor's office and your blood pressure's high just because you're worried? I struggle with it. Do you struggle with it? You see people all around me worried about dying and worried about getting sick, and I believe firmly that the enemy likes to take your mind and make you think that he's won this whole thing. He wants you to think that this thing called death is the very end, and when you die, it's all over. But Scripture is very, very clear that death is just the beginning. On that first Easter morning, it would change everything for all of history, that the angel would say to the women, don't be afraid. I mean, how many times does the Bible tell us, don't be afraid? For I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. I want you to say that with me this morning. He is not here. He is risen. One more time. He is not here. He is risen. We might say in the South, he ain't here. He's risen. Come and see the place where he lay. It's what the angel said. Jesus' heart had stopped. His body had grown cold. He died a very violent death on the cross so that there was no question so that everybody would know that he was good and dead. There's no question. Three days later, though, he would come back to life. He was gone, but he would have life back in his body. The linens, the linens that were there in the tomb would be wrapped nice and neatly where he had folded them himself before he got up and left. Some tried to claim that the body was stolen, but there was a guard there, so there was no way the body could be stolen. But how could it be? How could it be this Jesus who had died was up now walking around somewhere. In fact, he would spend 40 days appearing to people on earth and the news would spread like wildfire. You know, death is a pretty scary thing. I mean, you look around and I just got up this morning, I was reading the news and, and I'm looking at how many people it says such and such died, such and such died and there's all these random accidents. I, th I think about this past week about the ship that ran into the bridge. What a random accident. Somebody young, a car full of people, a teenager, a child. It's estimated there are over 56 million deaths occurring annually in the world. 56 million annually. That translates to approximately 4.6 million deaths monthly, 150,000 daily, 6,000 hourly, 106 every minute, nearly two deaths every second. I know that sounds depressing, but it's the reality that death will come for all of us. We shouldn't be shocked. Death is a part of living. In fact, the day that you were born is the day that marks the day you will die because you will die. 
It's the formula. Sin equals death. And when sin entered the world, death entered the world. It's what Romans 6, 23 says. It says, for the wages of sin is death. But listen to this. Listen to this. But the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. The wages of sin is death. But the gift, the gift that God gave us through his son is eternal life. See, as long as there's sin, there will be death. And there'll be sin until Jesus returns. Jesus conquered sin on the cross. He who had no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But he didn't erase death. I hate to tell you guys, but the body is gonna fail. No matter how much brains, muscle, great hair, I can vouch for that. Perfect curves, beautiful skin, no matter what you have, it won't last. Ask somebody over 40. It didn't last. No matter how much you try to stay young and healthy, no matter how many Fitbits you wear, how many gluten-free sandwiches you, you prepare, your body will eventually fail you. But the Bible says your spirit will not. It says that the body will fail, but the spirit actually lives on forever for everybody. Everybody's spirit will go on to somewhere. See, Paul is very clear, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. He says, for we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Now listen to this, I like this. It says, meanwhile, we groan. You ever groan? You ever listen to anybody, I won't say an age, but you listen to an older person, when they sit down and when they get up, they groan? You ever hear, they go, Oh, oh, it hurts. As meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead of our heavenly dwelling. Isn't that exciting? To you know that we're going to have a different, a different, a new body? It says, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked, for we are in this tent. We groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. I know it's hard, folks. I know it's hard if you're dealing with an illness or if your knees are getting bad or if your back hurts or uh, if, you're, if you have a terminal illness. I know it's tough. I know it's hard, but the Bible's very clear that this is not the end. In fact, Jesus says that what's on the other side of this is so much better compared to this that we shouldn't live for this world. We should live for the next world. We should live for what Christ has prepared for us after this. In John 14, he describes it, and it's a beautiful place. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus says. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Jesus is preparing the party. Now, Jesus was the party planner. I mean, he is the one that made the wine show up at the party when there was no wine. I mean, he is the one that can do all things. And he's in heaven preparing a place for us. And then he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may be where I am, that you may know to the place where I am going. Jesus is gonna come get us. And this is not going on forever. Can you imagine walking into heaven? I think about this a lot. Jenny and I were just talking about it last night. You know, we said, ah, the pain and suffering isn't gonna go on forever. One day we will walk into heaven and we walk into the gates of heaven. There will be no more crying, no more suffering, no more pain. The old order of things will pass away. The new will have come. There'll be no more aches. You'll have your new body. You'll see the people that have passed on before you who knew Jesus and they'll have new bodies and they'll be happy and whole and there's no sin and no fussing and no uh, uh, people uh, get, getting upset with each other. No more anger, no more shame, no more guilt, no more regret the old has gone the new will have come that's something to get excited about I cannot imagine there's nothing more valuable than the security of your salvation the assurance of your salvation if there's nothing else to preach on Easter is that you can have the assurance of your salvation to know that neither height nor debt nor angels nor demons nor nothing else in all creation can separate us from the love of God does anxiety about sickness ever get to you? 
Do you ever go, oh my gosh, what if I get sick? I mean, what if I have to suffer? Does anybody here like to suffer? You just enjoy it. You wake up and you go, oh, I love the pain. I love the worry. Oh, the angst is so wonderful. The fact that I have to worry about tomorrow, is so great, isn't it? Nobody does that. You see, God doesn't want us to live in that state of mind. He wants to live in the exact opposite. He want, he's got us in the palm of his hands. I can't imagine not having Jesus as my Lord to walk around in worry and angst all the time and not have heaven and not have the hope of heaven. Or, or worse, to have the fear of hell. To, to not believe it, to be agnostic, to have no hope in anything. See, we shouldn't live like that. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, he says, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. He says, rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I believe when we start living is when we stop worrying about dying. If you can let go of the fear of dying, you can really live. What did Christ, or what did Paul say? He said, for to me to, what? To live is Christ, but to die is what? To die is what, folks? Okay, you gotta get this tattoo. You need this now if you don't know this, if you don't know this scripture. For me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And what that means is if I live, things are good. If I die, things are good, if I know Jesus. See, I believe most of us value our life much more than we value our commitment to the Lord. We don't wanna risk our life because we would rather live in the safety and security of health and happiness. But Jesus calls us to give all. I'm telling you today, if you've been diagnosed with something, if you have a friend who has, if you have a terminal illness, if you have a sickness, it's not gonna have the final say. Jesus Christ is gonna have the final say. I know that's scary, but that's why he came and died. The Bible says over and over again, it says over 365 times, the Lord tells us, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. Worry is the thorn that gets buried in the soul. What if something happens to me? What if something happens to my kids? What if something happens to one of my loved ones? My dad told me one time, he said, Justin, you worry so much about what if something happens to you? He said, I'm gonna tell you what. I'll tell you what's gonna happen if something happens to you. The world's gonna move on. Well, that was a good reminder. <laughs> it was true. The world would move on. The Lord would take care of my family. The Lord would take care of my kids. The Lord would certainly take care of the church. See, we have to stop focusing on sickness and focus on the salvation. Start sharing the good news of Jesus with people. When Jesus died, he made a way. And the message that would come is the same thing that happened to him would happen to us, that if we believed in him, that if we called upon his name, Romans 8, 11 says that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. If we could just grasp this. When Satan comes, he knocks on the door of your mind and he wants to play havoc with you. If we could just remember the promises of scripture. And we could tell Satan, Satan, you have an empty threat because Jesus had an empty tomb. You have an empty threat because Jesus had an empty tomb. I fully plan on seeing all my loved ones in heaven when I arrive. All those who knew the Lord, I cannot, I uh, would be negligent to not tell you that when we die, it's not just about heaven, but it's also, there's a place called hell that Jesus speaks of an awful lot. He referred to that place as a place of outer darkness. He said, that's a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. People don't talk about hell a lot. In other words, all the joys that we associate with light will be withdrawn and the fears that we associate with darkness will be multiplied and there'll be a result of intensity of misery. And he referred to hell as a fiery furnace, a place of eternal punishment. And I truly believe the sickness and the pain that we endure on this side of heaven is nothing compared to what it would be like if we were to spend eternity separated from Jesus. But Jesus came to save us from that. That's what we celebrate on Easter. You don't know any verse, you should know this one. It's John 3, 16. Do you know what it is? We should all know it. It's one of the first ones most people memorize, but it says, you can say it with me, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have life eternal. 
We can't live in, all the t- in fear all the time. He wants us to live in peace in the shadow of his wings. That's Jesus. Everything hinged upon the fact that the tomb was empty on Easter morning. Because if Jesus was resurrected, that means that Jesus is who Jesus says he is. And if Jesus is who he says he is, he says that all those who believe in him will have life eternal in him and he's prepared a place for us. That is the wonderful, beautiful Easter story. That life in Christ is life that's meant to live in the freedom he provides. Freedom from worry and fear and soaked in trust of him. He is not here, he has risen. He is not here, he has risen. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you on this Easter Sunday that we remember the greatest event that altered the history of all humanity, the fact that our God who came to earth, God incarnate and Jesus Christ, his Son, would go to the cross, die a violent death, but on the third day he would be raised from the dead. The tomb would be empty. You would not be there for you had risen, Lord. Father, we thank you on this Easter Sunday that we can gather and celebrate the birth, or the the joy of the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we prepare to come to this communion table, Lord Jesus, remind us of the great sacrifice that he made. Remind us of the forgiveness of sin, the grace and mercy that we receive when we come to the table. In your precious name we pray, amen. I'd invite you to follow along in your bulletin as we prepare to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ through communion. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with a whole heart. We have failed. and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread and gave thanks to you gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by his blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
invite you to pray with me. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you've given yourself to us. Grant that we may go in the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. the comfort of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this whole church said, Amen. Amen.